Tonight on Panorama, the great testing gamble. The stakes are very high indeed. Testing is absolutely critical and central to preventing a second wave now. Thousands of lives now depend on the government getting testing right. We should be very concerned until we can see there is a fully effective testing and contact tracing system in place. So why do our COVID investigators have nothing to do? I have had zero cases, absolutely zero. And why haven't millions of test results been shared with the NHS? There is no transfer of data into a clinical record at the moment. Because I gather just... there's an aspiration to do that in the next few weeks. But we need it now. It would have been helpful to have it a few weeks ago. We're facing an invisible killer. So we need to see every road, every place where COVID is spreading. The only way to track the movement of the disease is to test, so we can follow the infections and trace those that may have it. Now, after so many deaths, the UK is relying on this system to keep us safe as we come out of lockdown. I think it's a real worry that we are lifting the lockdown restrictions in, in a slightly sh sort of shambolic fashion um, without a proper test, trace and isolate system. Everyone wants to get out of lockdown, but we need to get out of lockdown safely, otherwise we're going to see um, mini flare-ups, epidemics in, in, around in regions, and people are going to die as a result. So far, the data suggests our testing hasn't been impressive, only detecting around one in four infections in the community. We've already reached a target of 10,000 tests per day as committed. For most of this crisis, testing has been about numbers. We're ramping up the testing with capacity now at over 73,000. The number of tests yesterday, on the last day of April, was 122,347. I think it was helpful, and uh, from a situation where we didn't have enough testing capacity, I think that decision to, to target 100,000 and to really uh, throw everything at getting that uh, transformed the testing capacity that we had. The ambition clearly is to get up to 200,000 a day by uh, the end of this month and then to go even higher. Of course, more tests are better than fewer. But some say focusing just on daily targets is not enough. Trusts were saying very clearly that they were concerned that the over-obsessive focus on the 100,000 target was distorting what should have been a strategic approach to testing and that we were just chasing that target and we were missing the fact that trusts were simply not able to get patients and staff tested quick enough, certainly within the 24-hour international standard turnaround time. The pursuit of big numbers was about a government trying to fight back from a bad start. When COVID first hit, the UK didn't have enough testing. We couldn't see the disease spreading. The government then stopped all testing, apart from patients already in hospitals we will pivot all of the testing capacity to identifying people in hospitals who have got symptoms. But we needed to urgently increase the number of tests we could do. Rather than relying solely on our public sector labs, the government asked private companies to build a new testing system. It 
includes the drive-through centres that collect samples and the not-for-profit labs that check for the disease. So this is one of the new labs that's being used to process COVID tests. And we've been told that here they have quite a high rate of failed tests. But these void tests are still counted in the government figures. It's usually not the lab's fault. There have been problems with the samples collected nationwide. Mistakes and kit that doesn't work means that more than 90,000 tests have had to be voided. Accountancy firm Deloitte oversees the private companies that collect the samples for profit. It says 97% of tests are valid and that void tests are immediately investigated. Any improvements are implemented as quickly as possible. I don't think it would have surprised anyone in advance if you had said that in some cases um, there will be uh, there will be teething problems that will need to be ironed out. Not everything will work right first time. Um, but nevertheless, I think it has been very important to establish that capacity. There's also a basic design flaw. The private network was built at speed and wasn't fully integrated with the NHS. So test results weren't passed between the two systems. They're sent to the person who's been tested and Public Health England. But local councils, hospitals and GPs are left in the dark. So if somebody is tested, somebody yeah. in this area gets tested, yeah. their GP yeah. and their hospital won't get to know that data? No. There is no transfer of data into a clinical record at the moment. I gather just... there's an aspiration to do that in the next few weeks. But we need it now. It would have been helpful to have it a few weeks ago. How big an issue is this parallel structure and this kind of data black hole? How big an issue is it? You know, if you assume testing does contribute to our management of the pandemic and, and that, that eventually um, saves lives, if we're not delivering effective testing, then that has to cost lives. The Department of Health says the public and private labs complement each other. It's working to link test results to patients' records. We've also examined how the tests are taken in the new privately run system. Either you're sent a test in the post or you use one of the drive-through testing centres. I'm on my way to a testing facility, which is in the car park of Manchester City's Etihad Stadium. Its staff are low paid. Workers told us they haven't seen a nurse or doctor on site. PPE isn't used properly. And frontline staff have had hardly any training. The words of one worker are spoken by an actor. I was really, really surprised by the lack of medical involvement. I assumed there'd be doctors or nurses on site, and I assumed the tests would be carried out by healthcare workers. It's jarring to know the site's not run by the NHS, even though it's written everywhere. The same gloves are used all day by people on entry and exit lanes from what I've seen. It's a hotbed for infection, so we need to take precautions. I feel the government has made a serious error with the reliance on untried private sector companies to run these drive-through testing centres when they could have chosen to use the expertise already there in our local government, in Public Health England, and build that up instead because you have there the clinical experts that you need to do this to the right standard. Deloitte says it doesn't oversee the daily running of the site, but all staff must have the required training for their roles and comply with national PPE guidelines. The Department of Health says it's a fantastic achievement to have built a large-scale testing programme, which can now provide a test to anybody who needs one 
and can deliver more than 200,000 tests per day. 8.7 million tests have been delivered thanks to the public and private sector working together. This is how they do testing in Germany. The first step is to validate the insurance card of the driver and his telephone number in case if he is positive. In Heidelberg, it's a doctor in full PPE supported by medical students. They have uh, operation suit, FFP2 mask, face shield, and all the time they're wearing three pairs of uh, hand gloves. And you're a doctor. Is there always a doctor here? It's necessary that one doctor is here all the time. If it's difficult to get in there, a doctor can maybe help. And the system seems to be working. There have been isolated outbreaks, but most of Germany is pretty much back to normal. Germany has a bigger population than the UK, but has had about a fifth of our COVID deaths. One big difference is they built testing capacity much earlier, so they could test those with symptoms and those without. That matters because many people who have COVID, they show no symptoms. So no one knows that they're infected and they're spreading the disease around. And if they work in a hospital or a care home, then that can be deadly. If you only chase the people with symptoms, can you defeat the disease? I don't think so. Why? Because if you just only test those with symptoms, you you just do not get the whole iceberg. You just only see the top of it. And so you're running behind, actually. All of this should be no surprise to the UK. I've been here for three and a half, four years now. So that's, that's our lab environment there, that's my office. Researchers at this top lab put out a warning back in April. So these are actual swabs, or what's come from the swab? That's right. This is, this is the sort of residue from the swab. And the government was told about the risks. COVID-19 was different from other viruses and had a dangerous characteristic. Just under half of infections could be associated with a significant period where that person is asymptomatic. We've been very surprised about this and quite shocked. There can be a peak period of infectivity two to three days before the onset of symptoms. And so if you don't know you've got symptoms but are highly infectious, that to us is a very dangerous position to be in when you're providing health care to vulnerable patients. The difficulty is if you don't look for it, you won't find it. But because we only had limited testing capacity, for months the UK could only test those with symptoms. That meant people who didn't know they were infectious were spreading the disease in our communities and in our hospitals. Should the government have reacted more quickly when they became aware that asymptomatic carriers were a big problem? My view is yes, they should have done. The only conclusion I can come to on the basis of the evidence that is widely available now is that asymptomatic transmission occurred in, in healthcare worker environments, in community care homes almost certainly. The numbers of deaths I would not be able to estimate, but I'm, I'm certain that, that deaths occurred as a result of this. Healthcare workers can infect vulnerable patients as they move between wards. So the warning was straightforward. Test frontline staff in hospitals or the disease will spread. 
I think looking back, this is a major flaw that follows directly from a lack of capacity. And it goes back to this uh, question of choice and prioritisation, that if you had enough capacity, you wouldn't have to do. But if you have a limited number of tests available, then it's not surprising that you will focus them on people with symptoms. The government says it's prioritising NHS staff and wants to introduce more regular testing. But routine testing still isn't widely available. You can't describe the testing regime as fit for purpose until you've got a regime that is able to consistently and regularly test all staff and all patients. And the really worrying bit is we don't have a clear plan and timeline of when we're going to get there. It matters because when NHS staff aren't tested, lives are at risk. In May, the loosening of the lockdown drew big crowds to Western Supermare. The local hospital was forced to shut for more than two weeks after being overwhelmed with COVID cases. Many thought the day trippers had brought the disease with them here to Western Supermare, but it wasn't their fault. COVID was actually being spread around the hospital by NHS staff and by patients. Many staff didn't know they had the disease because they hadn't been tested and they didn't have symptoms. There wasn't easy access to testing and it was very, very hit and miss. The reality seems to be that the lack of testing meant that staff were going into work, being exposed to the illness, and asymptomatic staff were still going about their work and quite innocently, you know, adding to that infection risk. And the lack of testing meant the hospital didn't know how widely the virus was spreading. Dad never had like a picture by himself. Like it was always with family. With family, one of us. Amar Diaz was a hospital worker who fell ill at the start of April. My dad is a very fun, loving, kind, gentle, humble man anyone can ever meet. Honestly, like me and Amy are just truly blessed by God that we had a dad like him. Amar's whole family are health workers, though we don't know where he caught COVID. He isolated at home, but was refused a test until he was taken to hospital. When he was taken to the hospital, I called my dad up and he said, I'm, I'm getting put on a ventilator, darling. I love you, I have to go because they want me, I, I need to go. Mum told us that the last she saw my dad was him waving kisses and saying goodbye to her. It was horrible, like horrible of a feeling. And at 9.30, the, the nurse said, he's gone. And said, Minnie, he's gone. I, I, it's, it's. Yeah, and it was, it was like, what else can we do? To see like my dad walk out the door with his own two feet. He walked out on his own and he, he never, never came, came back. Six weeks after Amar died, the hospital closed and all staff were finally tested. The results were shocking. A hundred members of staff at this hospital were infected with the disease. And patients were infected too. We've discovered that in April, there were 29 COVID-related deaths. In May, there were 27. Amar died in April, but the hospital says his infection occurred before the outbreak and was unconnected. I know for a fact that my dad was taken care of very well by the hospital people. They all know my mum and dad. 
the only thing that could have been done that a lesson that could be is for simple thing as a testing could have if that was there you never know what the outcome could have been Western Hospital says it's tried to follow national testing rules and made significant efforts to minimize staff movements. The trust is now undertaking a serious incident investigation and has commissioned a lessons learned review. It wasn't just here. 20% of all COVID patients are thought to catch it in hospital. It seems to me that we ought to have cracked, actually probably some weeks ago, um, and, and put in place a regime uh, of testing asymptomatic people, at least in those settings that are, uh, are particularly risky, especially in care homes and in NHS uh, settings. The price of the missteps and the mistakes the government has made is that more people have died than should have. There have been avoidable deaths in this country from COVID-19. Testing is only half the answer. In Germany, and almost every country that successfully contained COVID, it's about tracing everyone who might be infected. And this is the model that we're now putting our faith in. The way this works in a community is anyone who tests positive here in Germany, they're phoned and they're asked who they've been in contact with. Those contacts are then asked to isolate. Bit by bit, the disease is chased out of the city. Guten Tag, Jedin Hong, mein Name vom Gesundheitsamt Rhein-Neckar-Kreis. Sie wurden uns ermittelt als Kontaktperson von einem bestätigten Corona-Fall. They've been contact tracing since the start of the outbreak. It's run by the local public health authority. We track down people who've gotten contact without knowing that they have gotten a contact to the coronavirus. So we are trying to like close it down. Das heißt, in Ihrem Fall wird dann die Quarantäne von letzten Kontakt, also von gestern, von Montag, 22. Vorletzten Sonntag war Ihr letzter. And the tracers keep in touch to make sure everyone potentially touched by the disease is identified. We're asking. It's like 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 a little bit of Sherlock Holmes situation. You know, we we've been detectives. Uh, it takes a lot of patience to ask on the telephone, where have you been last, uh, the last day? Where have you been two days before? And so we've been able to find, let's say, one patient, about 10 people, contact people. What has Test and Trace done for this community? I think it, it, it saved life, lives. It saved a lot, maybe a lot of lives. <laughs> Tracing allows us to see how the disease is spreading through our communities. But with the phone app now delayed, do we have a strong enough system in place? We will have a test, track and trace operation uh, that will be world beating. And yes, it will be in place. It will be in place by June the 1st. England's new tracing system has only been running for a month. It's in two parts. There are existing teams of local public health experts who work on the bigger outbreaks in places like schools and care homes. And then there are 25,000 new contact tracers working from home. Most are low paid and working for private companies. They're supported by staff with medical experience. So prior to today, I have had zero cases, absolutely zero, none at all. And I've done approximately two to three shifts per week. I feel guilty 
for being paid to do nothing. The workers we spoke to didn't want to be identified because they could lose their jobs. The majority of the days that I have worked, I have not had any um, contacts to trace at all. At first, I thought that I was doing something wrong, and I've joined um, some help groups on social media, and other staff are, are saying the same. They're reassuring me that it's the same for everybody. Me sitting here, clicking refresh, and I'll do that now. Click and refresh, nothing. There are no cases for me to do. No, absolutely nothing. But the government says it's built a new service on a scale never seen before, and having an overcapacity is a real success. It's already helped to stop more than 100,000 people from unknowingly spreading the virus. So what's going on? How can the new tracing system have contacted that many people if the call handlers say they're hardly speaking to anyone? But the government's figures weren't just for call centre workers. They also include cases that were being managed by professional teams on the ground. And it's these public health experts that are responsible for identifying and tracing most of the contacts. So it's not the government's 25,000 new recruits. The most recent figures show 113,000 contacts traced. But if you dig into the detail, you find that only 15,000 of those were traced by the expensive new call centre. The vast majority were contacted by just 870 staff in the public health teams. It was a surprisingly positive result. We thought, great, at last, maybe that they're getting to grips with this. So then to discover that actually this was largely down to the work that was already going on, on uh, in the background, I, I, I do find that very disappointing. I think the government, you know, weren't clear about that and the public have been misled. It's hardly surprising the new call handlers have nothing to do. In the first three weeks of the scheme, on average, they've had less than one successful contact call each. That matters because almost a quarter of people who test positive for COVID are still not being reached at all. We've got to get it right. This cannot just be swept under the carpet. We, we need this to work now. It's really surprising when you see the politicians at the briefing saying, how well the contact tracing service is going because the people that are actually working for the service know that that's not true, absolutely not true. Right now, keeping the disease in check is the difference between life and death. Thousands of lives are at risk if test and trace doesn't work. Fighting against the pandemic situation means you have to know who has a disease. If you do not know, you're running behind all the time. With less than 10% of our population having been infected, I think the maths are quite clear in my mind that the stakes are very high indeed. Our fight against this killer disease depends on finally getting testing right. A profound portrait of one doctor battling COVID at its peak. Italy's frontline doctor's diary is over on BBC Two in an hour.